to a little bit of music and uh, then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, as always, we thank you and we welcome you into this house. We ask that you would open our minds and our hearts to be able to receive your message today. Empty my mind and my heart of my troubles and myself so I may speak your word boldly. Fill me, Father, with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your love, your kindness, and your eternal word. We thank you, Father, for everyone who has gathered here today because we know we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ to glorify your name through the living word that comes to us through Jesus our Lord and Savior. We continue to pray for the community of Ray and all those who do not go to church. We ask, Lord, that you would have mercy upon them and not hold their sins against them, but would find a way to bring them into your bosom. Draw them in, Father, so that they may be saved. And we thank you, Father, we thank you for all the good things that come to our lives. We thank you for the water we drink, the food we eat. We thank you, Father, for nourishing our souls, our bodies, our family. We thank you for all the good people you place around us each and every day. Thank you for your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Spirit God to all 
like to start up the live stream. Good morning, my friends. I'm glad to see you have all made it here today because, as always, we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. He's alive. We welcome all of you who are joining us this morning from Facebook. And you're more than welcome to come into the church. We are open to the public. Doors open 8 o'clock every Saturday morning. And I'm here pretty much every day during the week. If you're ever in need of a prayer or a friend, or fellowship, you know, you're more than welcome to come. You don't have to be a stranger in the house of God. And this is a house dedicated to prayer, dedicated to the worship of God. And so we welcome each and every one of you. Let us open with a prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the wonderful things you're doing in our lives and all the wonderful things you're doing around the world. Sometimes it's hard for us to see those wonderful things, but nevertheless, we know you're doing wonderful things. And for that, we thank you. We thank you for all the love you're pouring out into this world. We thank you for the faith we have. We thank you, Father, for your word that encourages us, that builds us up, and that can heal us. And so we ask, Father, for your protection. Heal us this morning from the things that are binding us up, that are oppressing us, that are breaking and tearing us down. Heal our broken hearts. Come into our lives. Be our deliverer. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder sometimes, you know, if Jesus returned this afternoon, and, and nobody out here can say he's not coming today, <laughs> because nobody knows the day and the hour our Lord shall return, but if he returned this afternoon, what would he find you doing? Would he find you angry? Would he find you in a place of weeping and gnashing of the teeth? Would he find you worshiping an idol? What would the Lord find you doing if he returned today? Would he find you bickering and fighting and arguing over Who's going to be saved and which church he's going to come and, and save first? You know, that's a thought. That I wonder who's in heaven? Is, is heaven full of Baptists? Is heaven full of Methodists? Is heaven full of Catholics? Or is heaven full of God's children? God's children. And, and who are the children of God? Of course, everybody says all around the world, I am a child of God. Yet, I very rarely see the love of God shining forth from pretty much anybody. And it's difficult. It's difficult for me to believe that we live in a, in a community that loves God because we're so busy dividing one another. It's just all division. There's no sense of unity. There's no sense of love. I mean, if Jesus returned this afternoon, would he, would he find you tending to the needs of a stranger? Somebody who was broke down on the street? Hurt, alone, broken, wounded, left dead, half bleeding? Would he find you tending to their needs? 
If Jesus returned today, what would he find you doing? Would he find you in the midst of an argument? Would he, would he find you beating your children? Would he find you sucking on a pipe? Would he find you drinking a beer? If Jesus returned today, what would he find you doing? And do you care? Does anyone care? And I think that's the biggest struggle we're all facing right now. You should thank God Jesus hasn't returned yet this morning. You, he would catch you and you wouldn't be ready. You wouldn't be prepared. There's no way I believe he's going to find you doing what he called you to do. I don't believe it. Because I don't see it. I don't see it happening. And it's difficult for me. I love Jesus. I love God. I love the word of God. But I hate this world. I hate living in this world because this world is full of greed and sin, hatred, division, strife, envy, selfish ambition. It's full of everything God hates. And yet, it's these very same people who are full of wickedness that believe they are rich. We are the rich. We are the prosperous. Because you, you, you measure your, your worth, your value, through the possessions you own and the possessions you have. I almost wonder and believe that people don't want to come to our Father's house of prayer to worship because they have no ownership in it. They don't own anything. And I'm certainly not going to help you prosper or do anything good or be good, you know. I'm not going to donate my money to you. There's no benefit in it. There's no gain from me. It's interesting on how, how far we have fallen as a people and as a nation. I want to start here with Psalm 116. You know, I, I believe it's, it's difficult when, for anyone to, to believe in a God they've never seen, they've never heard, they've never encountered, they've never had an experience with. You know, that's, that's something that makes the Bible holy. It's 66 different books written over a course of thousands of years by hundreds of different people. And yet none of them really knew one another. But they all explain an experience they had, an experience that they had with God. And I'm not sure anybody can believe unless they've had that experience. Even Jesus says to, to Peter, blessed are you because God revealed to you the truth. God revealed to you the Christ. Not man, but God. And, and Peter couldn't believe Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, unless God had revealed it to him. Unless he had encountered Jesus, had an experience with Jesus. And yet if Jesus returned today, would you be ready for that experience? Do you even want that experience? Are you, are you ready to leave this world and all the goodness of this world behind? What are you ready for? Psalm 116 says this. I love 
the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his, his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, and the pains of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. You know, these are the people God listens to. You know, that's why I ask if if Jesus came today, would he, would he find you tending to the needs of a stranger? Right? Is Christ in you the answer to anyone's prayers? We pray every Sunday morning. I pray all week long for the community of Ray. Yet, yet nobody has the ability to be the answer to my prayers. The only reason nobody comes to church is because you choose not to. You don't see the value in it. He goes on to say, Oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, and my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. You walk with the Lord there in heaven, in the heavenly realms, in heavenly places. I mean, there's a lot of people, and maybe that was including myself, you know. That it's very tough to, to love Jesus with all of your heart and, and all of your mind and, and all of your strength until after he has put your treasure in heaven next to him. And sometimes the greatest treasure of our lives is our son who was taken when we weren't ready. Sometimes the greatest treasure was, was our wife who was taken when we weren't ready. Or our husband, our friend, somebody we loved and cherished. And when the Lord took them, well, then I had no choice but to believe. Because where do you believe your loved ones are? Do you believe they're with God? Do you believe God is merciful? Do you believe he, he loves you and the things that you love, the people you love? I mean, we're all so caught up in our religiousness that the only people we, we, we truly believe are saved are, are the, the members of our own church, those who love us. And we only love those who love us back. We only lend to those who repay us. Those are the things that divide us. I believe even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? Is there anything we, we can give to the Lord for our salvation? Is there anything we can give to the Lord to show our thanks for the lives we have? Is there anything we can give to Him? And yet, the Lord really demands nothing of us. 
demands nothing from us. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. This is precious to the Lord, the death of his saints, because God displays his glory through the resurrection of the dead. I know everybody's waiting for this pre-tribulation rapture. Everybody's waiting for the rapture, but did they never want to acknowledge that it is the dead that rise first? Not the living, but the dead will rise first. And it was for that reason Jesus came into the world and died to be the first fruits of those who are rising back to life. I believe Jesus said to Martha, to Mary, as they were praying, and he even spoke of the rapture, of the resurrection. We know on the last day, Lord, with a great trumpet blast, you're going to call out to all the dead, and they will rise. They will come back to life. But we know also that if you ask God for anything, it will be done. And then Jesus says to them, while standing in their presence, I am the resurrection. I am the life and the truth. And yet nobody believes in it. If you believed in it, wouldn't you give to the Lord all that you are in order to gain him? I know he gave all that he was in order to gain you. That's why I think it's very important we start each and every day with prayer. I've been putting out prayers to those who are on my friends list and Facebook ended up blocking me because I guess they, they violated their policy. Prayer violates their policy. Because it has power. It has power to overcome death and sickness. It has power to overcome disappointments and oppression. It's power to overcome anger, bitterness. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosened my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in the midst of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. God asks for one thing. Say thank you. Be full of thankfulness. We see in Luke chapter 11. What is Jesus going to find you doing when he returns? And if he returns today, is he going to find you right here in this spot? Because it's very amazing that all these people were expecting Jesus to come, the Messiah to appear to them. They saw the prophecies. They, they knew the word of God. Yet when Jesus did appear to them, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that the love of God was so powerful, was so great. And they began to argue and divide. Verse 14, chapter 11 says this. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. And the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. While others, 
to test him, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a divided house hold falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judge. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than him attacks him and overcomes him, it takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. You know, we, we look into the world and, and we look into the propaganda being poured out all over social media, the news, and all these different outlets. And the reason we believe the world is growing darker, the reason we believe sin is growing, is because the house of Christ is divided. It's divided. It's divided in, into seven different churches and even this small town. A hundred different churches all across the state. Thousands of different churches and denominations all across the nation. And everyone pointing their finger and bickering about the other. None of them are united. And so the devil has his foothold inside of the church. And that's why it's failing. That's why it's breaking down. That's why people don't come to church anymore. You know, I don't, I don't complain about the folks who are in church. There's only 200 people in this town that go to church. There's 1,800 people who don't go to church. And the only God they know of is the God they have created. The God they approve of. And that's always what it comes down to. And, and that's what we see here as a, a people who are idolaters. We worship only a God we approve of. And we don't approve of the things you're doing because you're doing the things we cannot do. It says, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds a house swept and put to order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. And while he was saying these things, a woman in the crowd raised up her voice and says, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and blessed is the breast which nursed you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Those who hear the word and obey it. <clears throat> Jesus came to them as a stranger, outside of their approval, with the authority of God, and not that of man 
or if it's some sort of an organization. And even today, we stand divided, we stand unsure of those who come into our communities and come into our, our homes and our towns uninvited, without our approval, without our acceptance. Because that means there's a God greater than my own creation. Sometimes God wants to tell us the things we need to know instead of the things we want to hear. Jesus says, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it, except for the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to bear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment day with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And even now, even today, even within your own hearing, you are hearing the word of Christ, the living word of God. And yet so many don't believe it, don't want to believe it. And one of the most motivating reasons not to believe it is you know if Jesus returned today, he's going to find you doing exactly what he knew or what he asked you not to do. What you know is wrong. You know within yourself. You're full of darkness. You're full of hatred and division and selfish ambition. It's better to not to believe in a God. It's better to believe that I'm going to be wiped out, turned into nothing, than to believe there's a good God full of righteousness who's going to judge the world for what they've done to one another. says, no one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in, in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. It says, therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your body is full of light, having no part dark, you will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. If our eyes are the lamp unto our body, what are you staring at all day long? What are you listening to all day long? What's filling your mind? What's filling your body all day and every day? Hatred? Division? You know, if we sat there and watched the news all day long, eventually you will be full of hate and division. Because they're always telling you, no matter which side of the spectrum you're on, to hate the other side, to divide yourself from the other side. We do no different than that which is in church. 
Are we, are we looking out into a world only to see darkness? To see the works of evil? Can you even see the goodness of God and the love of God in this world? Some of them were really upset that Jesus came to dinner and, and didn't wash his hands. And it wasn't that you washed the dirt off your hands. You, you had to go through the religious ritual of washing your hands. And as you pour the water and the stuff upon your hands, you know, blessed am I, blessed, and, and say these little sayings and that. And Jesus says, it doesn't matter. If you wash the outside of the tomb, the outside of the body, because the uncleanliness comes from within your own heart. It says, now you Pharisees, now y'all you religious folks, religious people, cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did you not know who made the outside make the inside also? But give alms those, those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue, and every herb, and neglect justice, and the love of God. You know, and I live in Ray, Colorado. <laughs> people hate it when I say this, especially my family, because it prevents people from coming to church. It is a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. Four times. Four times. The only time somebody calls this church, the only time somebody wants to be a part of this church is when a homeless man is walking through town. Because God forbid they show mercy to a stranger. Oh no, it's, let's call Dave. Let's call David. And because nobody else wants to deal with strangers. They don't like strangers in this town. And I am one of those strangers. The only time they call me is when somebody needs help. Someone needs a place to stay. And it's hard to open your house to a stranger when you have no idea who they are or where they're from. I get it. I understand. You know, we have people call, yeah, our church doesn't help people in your community. But you're the first person I thought, if anybody's going to help that person, surely it's going to be you. And of course, there, there's no community here or people tithing or paying alms or anything. I mean, our family, we, we've invested some $300,000 into this place. We're tapped out. But because I love God, I called that person, I contacted that person and talked to them. And do you think they would ever step one foot into this church, even after finding them help? Finding them a way for their bills to be paid? They won't even say thank you. Not even the least. But it's okay. Because that's what Jesus trained us to do, right? To tend to the needs of those who won't even say thank you. And so I thank God for the training I have. I thank God for the love he has given us. He goes on to say, These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like 
unmarked graves and the people walk over them without even knowing it. Walk around always seeking the glory of man, the acceptance of men. I mean, that's, that's the trouble kind of with the people of this community. So long as you are a member of their church, they love you and they care for you because they have no choice. Their sustainability comes from the tithes and offerings of their members. And I've been to churches where we spent 30 years of our lives there. And the moment we had problems, the moment tragedy entered into our lives, there was nobody to be found. No one to be found. There was no help. There was no love. There was no care. It says, Woe to you, warriors, also. For you load people with burdens hard to bear. And you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. You are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets, and apostles, some of whom you will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. And you yourselves did not enter. And you hindered those who were entering. Nobody ever wants to turn away from sin. Nobody wants to admit greed is evil and it's wicked. Nobody ever wants to admit the only religion God will accept as pure and holy is the taking care of widows, orphans, the fatherless, the downtrodden. How you receive a stranger is exactly how you're going to receive Jesus Christ. Come into a town and a community where I've been sent by God, only to be ostracized shunned by the entire community. And so we need to pray for this community. We need to pray for these people. Where will you be this afternoon? When Jesus returns, if Jesus returns this afternoon, today, where will you be? What will he find you doing? Book of Revelations, chapter 3, says it like this. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the word of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive. But you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember that what you received and heard and keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, 
I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. If Jesus returns this afternoon, will he find you worthy? Worthy. Will he find you trained? Will he find you doing everything he asked you to do? What will he find you doing? It's important. It's important. Many people don't recognize or, or understand. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. And if you died today, you will be removed from this earth and, and you'll be a part of it no more and you'll never be able to return. I mean, you're not going to be able to say to death, you're not going to be able to say to the Lord, hey, could you give me five minutes? Can you give me a few minutes? I'm, i I got to finish my text message. What is he going to find you worshiping? And if he finds you worshiping an idol, AI, do you think he's going to be pleased? Will he find you playing video games? What will he find you doing if he returns today? And are you ready? Are you ready? Are you able to receive him? The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's interesting, Jesus had to, had to send a messenger, John, to deliver a message to the churches because they weren't listening to God. They weren't listening to Jesus. They had time for everything. And they didn't have time for the Lord. Jesus says all those people who confess me in public places will be confessed there in heaven. In front of all the angels. The only problem is, is, can we confess that we can see the glory of God shining forth from the very least of our communities? Because if you can't see Jesus in the least, how are you going to see him in the greatest? He goes on to say, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your words. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. And I know that you have but a little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast 
what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write him, write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven, and my new and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, that's something I think we all truly desire to reject, is that you have just heard the word of the living God, that you have heard from Jesus Christ. Everybody wants to be an apostle, everybody wants to be a prophet, and in the days of old, God did speak through angels and apostles. The word angel is, is a messenger from God. That's what it means. Apostles are people who were sent by the authority of God, sent by Christ. And the prophets, and, and God spoke to the people through those people. But in his last days, in these times, God speaks through his son. He speaks through his beloved son. And that's what we are. We are the sons of the living God. All members of one body, the body of Christ. One spirit, one life, one way, one truth, one baptism. One faith, one hope, all of it wrapped up in the life of Jesus Christ. And we are members of that body. And, and that should be what unites us as Christians. Just that. One love. One testimony. So what divides us? What prevents us from loving one another? Is it our eye? Is it our eye? Our eye that focuses on the darkness and the hatred? Even Jesus says, if it is your eye that's causing you to sin, you ought to gouge it out. Be better to enter into heaven missing your eyes than to go to hell with both eyes seeing. What divides us as Christians? Jesus says if it's your hand that causes you to sin, you ought to cut your hand off. Because it'd be better to enter into heaven missing body parts than it is to go to hell with a full body. Jesus says sin is real. Evil is real. And his desire is for us to turn away from it. What's going to unite us as Christians? Jesus returns this afternoon. Will he find you tending to the needs of the broken? Will he find you actively loving one another? What will he find you doing? He says, I stand at the door knocking. It's I who stands at the door knocking. And, and he comes and, and he's knocking on our heart. He's knocking on our spirit. He's, he's desiring 
to come into us, to be a part of us, our each and, and every day. Is he there? Is he here? Has he returned? Jesus says, those who love me will obey me, and I will send to the one who loves me the promised Holy Spirit. And together, the Father and the Son will live together as one. Not as two, not as separated, but as one. It's one being, it's one person. It says, you will know God. You will know Jesus. Because he lives in you. He dwells with you. He loves you. Do you love God? Do you love him? Is today the day Jesus returns? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I love you. We love you. You are our Father. And we seek your kingdom. We, we seek the authority of your kingdom. We seek the love and the abundance of your kingdom here on earth, just as they do in heaven. And we seek it through your will. We know, Father, that the power of your will is greater than anything known who can stand against your will. We know, Lord, that it is your will that all men are saved by faith through Jesus Christ. Through you in the flesh. And so we seek your face. Shine your face upon us, O Lord, so that we may be blessed. Walk with us during this week. Live with us. And fill us, Father, with your Holy Spirit. So we may be holy. Fill my eyes with your goodness. So I can believe you're here with us. I love you, Jesus. And I thank you for all the mercy and the kindness you have shown to this family. I pray, Father, that you would heal the broken heart of my mother. I pray that you would heal the broken marriage of my sister. I pray, Father, that you would heal the broken lives of those who are watching today. I pray, Father, that you would heal this broken world because you're loving, because you're good, because we desire to praise your holy name. We love you, Father. Fill our homes full of joy and our hearts full of yourself. Father, Fill us with your strength. Encourage us and build us up so that we will be ready for your return. Lead us away from temptation. Guide us to the path of righteousness so our feet don't stumble and our tears melt away. Fill us, Father, with your love. In Jesus' name, amen.
We thank you all for joining us today there on Facebook. I hope we've encouraged you some way or, or another to find this desire within yourself to be ready. To be ready for the Lord's return. Be ready. Today could be that day. Ask yourself, are you able to receive him? Ask yourself, if he comes today, what do you want him to find you doing? Be honest with yourself. Be ready. Until next time, may the Lord be with you. For those of you who have joined us on YouTube, we invite you to sit back and, and enjoy a little bit of this music that we have. As always, we believe that God is pouring out His Spirit through this music. Receive it. Enjoy it. Open your heart and your mind to hear the Word of God. Let us begin. I think that song is a great reminder. <laughs> you know, people are always trying to convince themselves that the destruction of America has come upon us. And so we seek right now as elections and 
people are deciphering who's going to be the next president, the next congressman, the next leader of the free world, and we wonder who's going to save us from our problems. And you're going to be very disappointed if Jesus Christ isn't the one you're calling upon. There is no other savior than Jesus Christ. And, and that's the separation of dark and light. And that's what Jesus says to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes. I will dress you in white. Overcome, conquer, believe. There is no savior other than Christ himself. That's all there is. And you'll be sorely disappointed if you try to make somebody else your savior. You know, when I think about it, who, who did Jesus heal during his time? How many people has Jesus healed? Did he stop healing people at the resurrection? Or is he still healing people today? And to whom has he healed? And 
It's just as in the song, because I called upon the Lord, he heard me, he listened to me, he delivered me, he made me whole, he made me well. And, and, and that's because God won't infringe on anyone's free will. You have to want to come to him. You have to want to be healed by him. You have to want to be delivered by him. And if you don't want it, you're never going to experience the goodness of God. You'll never experience it because you don't want it. You have to want it. And everybody who wants it will experience it. They will be healed. That's the promise. And Christ is no liar. Keep that in mind. I think that song was a great reminder and it's just as if the Lord was speaking to us through it. Going to church doesn't guarantee you a way to heaven. Reading the Bible doesn't guarantee that you're going to be saved. Singing worship music every Sunday is not going to guarantee you will see the face of God. <laughs> Prophesying means nothing. Speaking in tongues has no value. Because a person void of love is absolutely bankrupt. Even if we offer our lives as a living sacrifice, yet we have no love. We've gained nothing. 
Love is of God. Love is God. And if we don't have love, we're bankrupt. So if Christ returns this afternoon, will he find love alive in you? Will he? Is that what you want him to find when he calls your name? Father, we just ask that you'd go with us this week. And like a child, we offer you our hand. Hold us tight. Keep us safe. Bless us with your love. Open our hearts and our minds to be able to love. To love the people who don't love us. To be good to a people who are not good to us. Father, use us to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. Just as Christ it's the answer to our prayers. Lead us, Father. Guide us. And be with us. We love you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there one more song or is that it? We got one last song. <laughs> Jesus' love changed the whole world. All right, guys. I love you guys. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Now we're thinking about some soul food for this yeah. afternoon. Something. Some lunch. <laughs>